October 12th, 1988. My shift was done. I was on my way down the staircase. It was time for me to go back to the Rusalka and plunge my mind into the abyss in hopes of staying sane. That's when I heard him. A flutter of a lab coat followed by the spine-chilling crack of a broken neck. The impact against the tiled floors had rendered the man unrecognizable. All I knew is he was one of my co-workers, or at least he used to be, before he met the Institute's mosaic head-on. Did someone push him? Did he jump of his free will? Small clumps of stern-faced scientists watched from the wings of the cathedral structure. The man was clearly dead. There was no helping him. We could only contemplate. I never found out who that man was or under what conditions his fall took place. The following day, all that was left of him was a solitary tooth tucked under the metal staircase in a vacant research station. Soon enough, the tooth disappeared. The further my research went on, the more aware I was of the dangers that could potentially be unleashed on humanity. Even with my daily indulgences in arts and sedatives, I could feel my sanity slowly slipping away. Not wanting to occupy my mind with matters unrelated to my research, I did my best not to think of the dead scientist. I'd almost forgotten him by the time Dr. Herkel entered my laboratory. It was maybe two weeks after his death, but he broached the subject as if it happened five minutes ago. He did not use the man's name, nor did he mention the research he had been working on. Dr. Herkel only spoke of the fall and a premature opening in the Institute's Council of Scientists. I had been deemed a reliable replacement. The Institute could only be run with proper oversight by individuals who understood the importance of the research being committed within its walls. My opinion on the matter is unimportant. I am expected to attend the monthly status report meeting tomorrow after my research shift is done. Dr. Herkel explained my new responsibility to me in a slow, somber voice. I was to become acquainted with all of the research being conducted at the Institute. I was to become familiar with the threats that faced the Institute, both internal and external. I, along with the rest of the Council, was to make decisions in the name of the United People's Institute of Science. The knowledge of my own demented research still sleep away at me at night. The brief glimpse of the madness which Dr. Alieva and Dr. Krimsky explore, the horrid flesh which Dr. Markarov occupies himself with, it is all simply too much. The weight of the knowledge I have been privy to so far is already too much, but I fear that tomorrow the thread of sanity that is still in me will completely sever. October 13th, 1988 It is far too much. This is all far too much. No individual, no group of individuals should ever have to shoulder this much responsibility. Tonight I sat in a room of people approaching their breaking point. There's far too few of us to make these decisions, to guard these secrets. Yet I know the room must remain small. With each person who is tasked with this demented knowledge, we drive humanity to the brink of disaster. A single resolve shaken, a lone folder of research lost. If any of the work being done at the Institute falls into the wrong hands, then all that is good in the world will be undone. I dare not write of the nightmarish things I have heard tonight. I do so in the name of safety. There can be no record of the things that were said in that room. But I also stay silent for my own sake. I cannot allow myself to think of the terror further. I have taken my medicine. I have fed from the bottle. Now all that is left for me is to lose my sense of self through art. I have to get a grip. The hotel sirens await me soon. December 13th, 1988. The council is starting to fracture. Countless dangers face us, both in the form of dangerous discoveries and from the ever more demanding political forces, but nothing scares me as much as the tensions within the other members of the council. There are enemies everywhere, yet we fight amongst ourselves. Some are calling for the complete shutdown of the Institute. Others, mainly Dr. Markarov, are calling for unification with a research facility beyond the Iron Curtain. Herkel still has control over the room, his demands are always followed, yet I do not know for how long he will retain his position of leadership. The man who stands at the helm of the Institute is old and there is no worthy replacement. Even if he lives long, 
Even if he survives another decade, even two, the horrid knowledge contained within the halls of the underground cathedral will not simply disappear. Beneath the earth there is a storm brewing and its effects will be catastrophic. When I was young, I wanted to be a cartoonist. I wanted to amuse and delight and impress. When I was young, I never imagined I would end up in this stuffy hotel room with my veins maligned with poison. My drawings have been taking shape. There's characters on the page. Characters of a story, a children's story, a story about a scientist. The images are still lifeless, but I know that with enough practice. All that I want to do is to clear my desk and commit myself to artistic pursuits. I want to draw and draw and draw until I fall asleep and then I want to wake up and draw again. But I know that I cannot. The hotel siren await me. If I do not sleep, my research will suffer. And my research cannot suffer. January 5th, 1989. I was returning from my lunch with the security guard when I found him. He was standing in the middle of the institute's mosaic, staring up at the impossible mess of doors as if he were a religious man facing a stained glass window. Whatever god Dr. Herkel was communing with was not a merciful one. As I walked by the old man, I could hear him quietly weep. I did not approach him. The man had always kept to himself and I knew it would be highly inappropriate of me to speak to him. I elected to walk towards my research station and mind my own business, yet just as I reached the stairs that would take me to my laboratory, Dr. Herkel spoke my name. It was a quiet whisper, barely perceptible, as if he didn't really want me to hear him. But I heard him. The man was haunted. He needed someone to speak to. I offered him an ear and my heart still regrets it. From what I gathered in the council meetings, Dr. Herkel's research revolved around the afterlife. He never spoke of any progress when the scientists gathered because there was no progress to report upon. He knew. There was no technology to master or ailments to prepare medicine for. Dr. Herkel knew what happens after one dies. The information still had to be contained. Widespread confident knowledge of the afterlife would still uproot most facets of society. Yet there was no urgency to Dr. Herkel's research which freed him up for administrative duties. Dr. Herkel never spoke of the specifics of the afterlife during the meetings. The room was already crowded with horrors that would chip away at the psyche. There was no need for us to know the tortures of death. During those meetings, when he was calm and composed and leading, he spared us of the knowledge. That afternoon, as I met him in the halls of the Institute, he showed no mercy. He spoke of darkness and helplessness and a song, a single song that repeated over and over for all eternity, its drums angry, its chorus insistent. Dr. Herkel spoke of a song with a single message, movement. The song would demand movement from the lost souls absent of all feeling or limbs. The song would drag on further than the human mind could ever comprehend, an eternity of darkness and drums and demands to dance. Dr. Herkel said he would be hearing that music soon. He had been fighting a malignant growth inside of his body for years, and now defeat seemed to be on the horizon. I had no words. There was nothing that I could say. He knew much better than me where his life, where all life, was heading. Dr. Herkel's description of the afterlife struck fear in my heart, but what was worse, what was infinitely more concerning, was seeing the head of the scientific council lose all grip on his emotions. Dr. Herkel must have registered the fear in my eyes. With a swift shake of the head, Dr. Herkel let go of all his sorrow and transformed back into the stern-faced scientist I was familiar with. He apologized for being unprofessional, told me not to worry about his health, and quickly retreated back into his office. For the rest of the workday, I tried committing all my energy to my research, but the intrusive thoughts of the Institute's future seeped away at my focus. They still do. Regardless of the poison I inject, regardless of how much I try to distract myself, I can't help but to think of the future. Herkel will die. I do not know when, but Herkel will die. Herkel will die, and the gathering storm clouds will burst into a blizzard of inhuman proportions. February 13th, 1989 
Markarov has been growing more unruly with each meeting, but tonight it feels like a line has been crossed. Midway through Dr. Aliyev's reports on those horrid parasites that she studies, Markarov stood up and launched into a diatribe against the Institute's rules. The United People's Institute of Science, he claimed, could no longer function under the protection of the USSR. The Soviet High Command under Gorbachev had grown weak and paranoid. It was just a matter of time until some overzealous bureaucrat would come snooping through the Institute. Markarov insisted that the only way the Institute could continue to function, the only way that its horrid knowledge could be contained, was to join forces with a research facility beyond the Soviet territories. He had been in contact with a scientist, a certain Dr. Green, who was in the process of studying the same organism that Markarov's research concerned. If the two halves of the foreign flesh were to be combined, if the Institute was to accept aid from the West, then the result of the Union would guarantee a solution to all of our problems. Markarov promised a source of powerful knowledge that could destroy any threat to the Institute before it even arose. He spoke of a research facility that would become incomprehensible in its capacity for science. Dr. Herkel rejected his proposal without the slightest hint of hesitation. I had never seen the old man turn to anger, yet tonight I have witnessed an untapped rage. Dr. Herkel was furious that Markarov would dare disclose information about his research to anyone, let alone a scientist from the West. Under the threat of violence, Dr. Herkel ordered Markarov to cease all communication with Dr. Green and to never broach the question of cooperation with the West ever again. We were to remain insulated from the outside world. The Institute's knowledge was to never leave the long halls of the cathedral structure. The show of force forced Markarov to back down, but once Dr. Herkel sat down, once the rage had left the old man's eyes, his exhaustion was undeniable. As Dr. Arlieva continued with her reports on the unearthly parasites she was studying, I couldn't focus. All I could hear were the short, labored breaths coming from the dying man at the head of the table. It's too much. It's far too much. March 14th, 1989. The show would be about a scientist. He would work in a secret laboratory and partake in important research, but we would never show the audience what is happening inside of the lab. No, research does not delight or amuse. The research that the scientist would commit his life to would not belong in a cartoon. No, there would be no research in the show. Instead, we would follow the scientist as he did things normal people do. He would go get haircuts and go to the supermarket and walk in a park and have fun. He would meet other people and they would be nice to him and they would laugh. The other people would have problems, complicated problems that required a sharp mind to solve. The, the scientist would help. He would invent and calculate and hypothesize and he would help. Everyone would hug him and Tell him what a great scientist he is and how the world is a better place because of him. He would make friends and be happy and have a life. And we would never see the research he worked on. The research would be the most important thing. Without the research, all of his friends, all the strangers in the supermarket, all of humanity, they would all perish. Without his research, the world would collapse but the audience would never know anything about his research. No. A cartoon is meant to be fun. A cartoon is meant to make you smile. April 13th, 1989. I've been seeing him in the Grand Hall of the Institute at least once a week. He stands in the center of the mosaic, looking up at the metal scaffolding of the Institute, humming. At first, whenever he would notice me, he would retreat back to his office, yet as the weeks went on, he gave up trying to hide his state. He just stood there and hummed to himself. I did my best not to listen to the melody. I did my best not to think about it. The thoughts of Dr. Herkel's ill health have plagued me with increasing consistency, but tonight, during the meeting of the council, they have reached a new feathered pitch. He arrived at the meeting with bandages wrapped around the right side of his head. Surgeons at the nearby clinic attempted to remove the growth that was shortening his lifespan. 
they did not succeed. Dr. Hercules blinds one eye, and each day he grows more frail. Each meeting Markrov's tone turns more rebellious than before. When asked whether he cut off contact with his Dr. Green across the sea, Markrov claimed that he did. But his tone, his composure, they would suggest otherwise. I cannot allow myself to worry about these things. I have to focus on my research. I have to. April 13th, 1989. Exterior, park, day. A young boy stands by the side of the pavement. He looks up into a nearby tree. His eyes are void of hope. He is sad. Suddenly, the boy turns. He sees someone coming down the street. Mr. Professor, Mr. Professor, please come and help me. Get out of my way, child. I have research to attend to. How can I help you, friend? My cat, Donnie, is stuck inside of a tree. Will you please help me put him out of his misery? Will you please help me rescue him? I do not have time for this nonsense. There is science to be done in my lab. Humanity will perish if I do not defend it. Are the firemen not available to help? The firemen are busy putting out the burning inferno at the hotel. There are flames everywhere. Hundreds dead. The city will never recover. The Rusalka is burning, but it must burn. No, the firemen are busy. I do not have time for neither you nor your worthless feline. If I do not return to the lab at once, if I do not commit my mind to the burning shackles of forbidden knowledge, humanity will crumble. You do not comprehend. No one can ever truly comprehend the horrors that I witness each day. Maybe I can invent a ladder from this pile of gardening equipment. November 5th, 1989. I have started to avoid this journal. They say that self-reflection is good for the soul, but each time I try to make sense of my day, each time that I try to reflect on where my life ended up, I find myself in more despair than I can control. My body and my mind are a husk of what they once were. The veins in my arms are bloated and streaked with darkness. I find myself seized by severe attacks of panic and incomprehensible sorrow on a daily basis. I am no longer the optimistic young scientist who arrived in this provincial town two years ago. I am a shell of a man, longing for peace I know will never come. Bernowski's paintings have long disappeared from the halls of Trusalka. The cramped halls of the hotel are completely barren and I no longer find any joy or inspiration walking through them. A couple of times I have attempted to speak to the elderly hotel clerk to ask him whether he would be interested in displaying any of my drawings, yet the man refuses to speak to me. The crimes that Bernowski was accused of, albeit invented, are far too severe for the hotel employee to trust another member of the institute. Instead of being displayed for the world to see, my art litters every corner of my room. Sometimes I have nightmares about a single spark turning my entire room into an all-consuming inferno. Sometimes I wake up and I don't consider those dreams nightmares. Dr. Herkel's health has steadily declined over the months. As a result of the surgery, the old man has lost an eye and judging by the way he grips the table whenever he enters the council meetings, I surmise he is blind in the other one. His speech drags, he often forgets what he is speaking about. During the last two meetings, a look of utter confusion drifted across his face as if he was suddenly unaware where he was. It is clear that Dr. Herkel is not long for this world. I fear what will happen next. I dread how the Institute will function once the man who has kept some semblance of control disappears. The world outside of the United People's Institute of Science also seems to be shifting. The cheery security guard whom I have taken my lunches with for the past two years seldom talks about work, but I have noticed an ever-growing stack of official documents on his desks. There are orders coming in from various branches of the Soviet High Command. Conflicting orders. Orders given under dubious authority. My world is shuddering at its foundation, and the burning notes of catastrophe are in the air. It's too much. It's far too much. I want to give up. I want to relinquish the minuscule pretense of control over my fate that I hold and surrender my body and mind to what is to come. But I know that I cannot. 
There is research to be done. The sirens await me. I should sleep. December 13th, 1989. Tonight's meeting of the Science Council barely concerned any research. There are outstanding threats within some of the experiments. There are issues that need to be discussed and solved. Yet while we focused our attention on the dangers of the dark knowledge being pried from the depths of the Institute, we completely forgot about the outside world. All of the available newspapers being heavily censored definitely helped keep us blind. Today, Dr. Herkel informed us of some serious changes in the outside world. The Berlin Wall has been torn down more than a month ago. Poland, Hungary, even my native Czechoslovakia are in the process of restoring their democracies. The Soviets are losing control at a rate that would suggest a complete collapse in the near future. No one knew what to do with this information. I have spent the past two years solving an incomprehensible puzzle of physics, but the possibility of freedom, of the Soviet stranglehold slipping from my country, it never occurred to me. For a moment I felt joy. For a moment I thought of how the people back home must have celebrated the fall of tyranny, but soon enough, the reality set in. The Soviet Union might be in the process of a collapse, but what has happened to United People's Institute of Science? Someone quietly asked a question to that effect. I do not recall who. All I recall is Dr. Hergel's response to the question. He opened his mouth as if to speak, yet no words left his lips. He moved around his jaw as if he were chewing through particularly rough meat and then, with no warning, he collapsed on the floor. Dr. Alieva and Dr. Novak were quick to provide aid. The old man was breathing, but he had lost consciousness. The scientists around the room started to mill around. The question of contacting the clinic was raised, but then, with a slam of the fist against the table, Markarov spoke. The man expressed himself with the fervor of a doomsday preacher. The council no longer had a choice. The Soviets would collapse and the research being done within the institute would leak out into the world. Or worse, the Soviets would plunder the institute for knowledge to prevent their downfall. Either way. The forbidden knowledge held in the depths of the Institute needed to be contained. He had a solution. All Markarov required was that no one get in his way. Turns out my instinct about Markarov was correct. He had not ceased his communication with this Dr. Green. In fact, he had convinced Green to send over the western breed of the organism which he had been studying. Once the two strands of flesh were connected, there would be nothing that the Institute would ever have to fear. All Markarov required was that no one get in his way. Markarov spoke with a certainty, with a confidence that none of us had. He was resolute in his belief that the organism that he had been studying could protect the secrets of the Institute. He had a solution. He was the only one with a solution. Before any dissent or agreement could be voiced, however, Dr. Herkel rose from the ground. The old man was dazed and could barely string a sentence together, but eventually he strained out a plea. He was not feeling well. He asked, with frail politeness, that the meeting of the Scientific Council be rescheduled to tomorrow. Silence descended on the room. Markrov's gaze shifted from person to person until it settled on me. He knew I wanted to say something to Dr. Herkel. I wanted to warn the old man of the plot that was taking place behind his back. Markrov's eyes suggested that if I was to indeed speak, I would be met with great misfortune. Dr. Herkel seemed barely lucid. I decided to stay silent. The pouch of syringes regularly delivered to my room is empty. I have drank all the liquor at my disposal. I can't think. I can barely breathe. It's too much. It's far too much. <laughs>